please welcome all the way from Cody, Wyoming, Julie Oriet and T.D. Kelsey. I wanted to talk a little bit about how T.D. and I met. And uh, we had run into each other at a couple of art shows and at the CA show occasionally and uh, just sort of knew each other. But uh, I had an opportunity when I was made a uh, honorary member of the Cowboy Artists to start going on some of their trail rides. And uh, this particular trail ride was where they filmed the Montana scenes for the Lonesome Dove movie. And it's not in Montana. The uh, production scouts had sent folks out to try to find some place close enough to Texas where they filmed the first two thirds of the story that looked like Montana, but they didn't have to schlep all that equipment and people all that way up there. And so they found this piece of land near Black Lake, New Mexico, just south of, uh, Eagle, of uh, Angel Fire about an hour east and a little south of uh, Taos, New Mexico. And it really is a little slice of heaven, isn't it, TD? It was, it, was a, it was a beautiful ranch. It really was really pretty. There were good people running the ranch at that time. So um, I was invited, and uh, all the members were invited to come early, two or three days early, and work some cattle. And so there was supposed to be about a dozen of the artists were going to show up and work cattle. And I thought this was my chance to really see how uh, cattle roundup is done and branding and all those other little things that they do to those poor animals. But <laughs> we won't talk about that. But um, we showed up, and it was TD and myself and Teal Blake, who at that time was the youngest artist, I think, in the Cowboy Artists. He was. And so the folks who had organized it said, well, if there's only three of y'all coming, they didn't bother to let the cook come. So uh, there was no groceries and no cook that was supposed to be there. There also was no porta potty and no showers that were supposed to be there. So it was TD and Teal and I roughing it for two days on this ranch. Luckily, TD had, I mean, uh, Teal had some uh, cooking equipment in the back of his truck that he keeps in there all the time yeah. just for such emergencies. And uh, I was designated to run the town and get some groceries while they were rounding up the first cattle. And that's where I got my nickname in the Cowboy Artists. Shaky Bob the camp cook. Yeah. yeah, that's right. But he took it. He took it with. It, they had a good sense of humor, so it went okay. But uh, these guys were uh, rounding up these cattle in some beautiful country, and uh, I was able to get some pretty decent shots. I thought, and uh, this is right where they come over the hill in Lonesome Dove, and they see that water, and they see the mountains, and they say, "This is where we're going to build a ranch, boys." And they all go, "Woohoo! Yay! We're done with the trail drive." He gives him about two minutes to celebrate, and then he says, get to cutting logs, boys. And the cabin is actually still there. It's just off to the left in this picture. And uh, the folks who own it were nice enough to let us auction a trip a few years ago in our gala for eight folks to go out there and spend three nights on this property. And I went out as their chaperone and, uh, again, was Shaky Bob the camp cook for them as well. And uh, that was a really magical trip. But uh, this is just some gorgeous country, and nothing beats New Mexico clouds in my book. Yeah, it was a beautiful, beautiful country. It was a good ranch. It was a really good ranch. Uh, there's a lot of wildlife on it, and uh, a lot of grass meadows. There's quite a bit of timber, but there was enough meadows and stuff for the grass, and the people that were running the ranch were really good cowmen. They took real good care of the country. It was, it was a nice, really nice place. And so that's how TD and I really got to know each other a little better. And it looks real romantic until you get to herding the cattle down a state highway. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty western, isn't it? That's a young, actually that sorrel horse is a young horse. I just, just started that spring. So he's getting a, this it, isn't it quite, a good day. It's a good day for him. Yeah, and this isn't quite as picturesque. No, that's not real picturesque. It's not like the wilderness, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what he was doing. We were probably upset at him. Freddie's going to scare the cattle just before we got them penned. Right, right. And so uh, this is teal, and uh, it hailed at one point while we were there. It snowed, it rained, it hailed. It, it did about everything over the two days we were there, again, without much in the way of accoutrements to uh, shelter ourselves or cook for ourselves or whatever, but we may do. And uh, this was the start of my campaign. Instead of eat more kale, eat more hail. Teal had this hail running off his hat, and it reminded me of the swamp donkey yeah, with the water, water running off, off the antlers. This hail was running off, t off Teal's hat, and he was catching his hand and eating it like it was popcorn. Yeah. 
We had a good couple of days, though. It was it was fun couple of days. Yeah. It was good to get to know everybody. And uh, I've told TD for years I thought this ought to be his profile picture because it it just says so much to me about TD. He's always hiding behind a horse <laughs> well, and putting yeah. the horse out front. And uh, he's such a shy guy and so unassuming. You heard him talk about that he doesn't market his work really and that he needs other people to help him with that. And so I just thought this was the perfect picture of TD, the especially nice as opposed to these two. <laughs> thought this was the mama bear and the papa bear of pictures and then you have baby bear. <laughs> I do like the one in the middle best. Oh, you're so I sweet. I said I do like the one in the middle best. You're so sweet. You. <laughs> well, it's a nice picture. And not to be outdone, uh, Julie has been a horse person most of her life as well. Mm -hmm. And TD, if you'll share that microphone with your lovely wife. In this picture, I was, uh, had been invited by a lady who was collecting some of my work. And she and her family had a thoroughbred breeding facility and racetrack and everything in California. And she said, you like to paint horses, don't you? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, why don't you come out, spend a week at the ranch, she said, none of us are going to be there. You can have the big house all to yourself. And so I flew down there, and I got to spend a week on this thoroughbred ranch, and I was in heaven. There was all the mares and the, the colts, and they had some young horses there. They were starting on the track, and I got to help the vet do a bunch of procedures. And I just sketched and painted and took photographs, and it was fabulous. I didn't get to go to that one. No. <laughs> uh, back up, if you will, Julie, and do the same thing we asked TD, kind of just sketch out where you grew up and how you got okay. into art. Uh, I was born and raised in the Gallant Valley outside of Bozeman, and I think we had a very idyllic childhood. We were out in the middle surrounded by a bunch of farms. We got to climb trees, play in the creek that ran through the front yard, always had a every stray pet in the world that you could have and and we we had a great childhood growing up i was very fortunate that my parents recognized that i liked to draw and so they always had plenty of drawing paper for me and things to work with i at one point here probably about 10 years ago before my grandmother passed away she said julie i always thought there was something really wrong with you when you were a kid <laughs> i'm like gee thanks grand boy you know it was she said, none of the other kids had any attention span. She said, but you could sit in the corner and draw for hours. She said, I thought there was something really wrong with you. And so, but I, and I remember that. I, I could. I just, I could give me some paper and a pencil, and I could go away with that. And actually, we grew up back by the Gallant River, across the river from where he grew up. And we didn't know each other, but we did. And... Um, and actually, there was something wrong with you. That we have yeah, that quote upstairs that proves it, right? I'm the sane, crazy person, or the crazy sane person. Either way, I am. And I did art course in high school, and I started out at Montana State University with a art major, a double major. And um, I eventually dropped out of the art program because they kept telling me I had no talent and I was a waste of time. And I was taking up space for somebody who could be better in their art department. So I thought, OK. So I thought, I just started doing little art shows. And was that similar to what TD's experience was? You were not wanting to do the subjects or styles they wanted you to do? No, I was willing to do them. I tried everything, but they, they evidently, still didn't like it. They, um, they were looking, I guess, for something different than I was looking for. And so um, I dropped my art major. I had enough to get a minor in art. And I started doing little local shows. And I had jobs that were all art related. I worked for some people who did sculptures for a while. And I painted decoys for a while. And I eventually, when my job as a decoy painter was they were going to replace me, I thought, well, I'll, I'll apply to an art show. And the first show I applied to was the CM Russell show. And everybody said, you'll never get in. You know, it takes you, you got to apply for years and years before they let you in. And I got in the first year, and little did I know, I had no idea what I was doing. I got there, and I was, but it just, everything snowballed. I met gallery people. I sold well. And it just kind of took off. I, I never had the intention to be a professional artist, but it just fell into place. 
And this is a big art show. I mean, this is not your local art show. This is a national level show, mm -hmm. artists from all over the country. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned earlier, I think in one of the gallery walks about that uh, part of this is you get a hotel room, you take all the furniture out, you turn it into your gallery, mm -hmm. and all these galleries are down the hall in the hallway in the hotel. Were you also participating in the big runway show with, with the auction? The auction. I, I did the auction and the quick draw for I don't even, I don't even remember how many years, a lot of years. So starting at your first art show, they're running the runway with mm -hmm. one of those models with one of your paintings. Mm -hmm. That had to be a pretty big deal. It was, and I was, I, I think I was kind of shell shocked. I had, because I really had no idea what I was getting into. I thought, oh, cool, it's it's a show, but it was so much bigger than I thought that it was. It was, it was. I mean, describe the scene there for that for people who don't have a sense of it. Um, there's there's a. It's a big, it's just big, a big show. Uh, magazine people there, galleries are there, famous artists are there. It's a very big deal, and and it's related to the C.M. Russell Museum and Charlie Russell, and that's who benefits from it. And I was overwhelmed. There was all these artists that I had admired and heard about for years and years, and I thought, well, uh, here I am, my piece is up there too. And I just, it was really difficult for me to. It was exciting, but it was kind of surreal because I thought I have no idea what I'm doing here. But it just it it just snowballed and it worked. And then at the auction, there's what five or six hundred people there in those days mm -hmm. or more. Mm -hmm. There's a runway down the middle of it, and they have these good-looking guys and gals who take the paintings yeah, and hold them up. Do you remember what your first one sold for? No, I don't. I really don't. I think I was in shock. <laughs> it, it went for a lot more than I thought. Uh, than it went more for than the asking price, and so I was, I was just thrilled. I kind of had no idea. And you were off and running after that. I was off and running, yes. So you never had to take a job teaching art or doing illustrations. I never really? taught. No, I I did the I worked for, at the foundry for a little while, and then I, and I did the decoys for a while. But once I started with that show, yeah, I, there was no looking back. I'm lucky. Very lucky. Absolutely. Now, TD, you've had a few other jobs in your life. I have had whatever it took to make a living, but I've always had a job that I liked. Uh, now, this picture, I trained cutting horses for several years, and this, uh, horses are my love of my life, for, other than Julie, of course. <laughs> but uh, Probably wild horses first, but cutting horses second. And uh, this photograph is of a two-year-old, that the best two-year-old I've ever mm -hmm. trained for fraternity. He was just fantastic, and it was, you know, it's just, it's, I love doing that. I love horses. And you mentioned earlier you're an airline pilot for United Airlines. Mm -hmm. You also did bush pilot flying? Yes, I flew for the airline for, I think, about 15 years, and I quit. Uh, they were great to me. The airline was really good to me, but I just wanted to be an artist. So I walked in the flight manager's office, and I had brought a, a pen from my co-pilot and written out a little letter resignation to make it official. And I walked in and handed it to my flight manager. Who, who, we were good friends. And he said, you, you can't do this. And I said, well, why can't I? He said, because I've never had anybody quit before. I fired a few, but we are, never had anybody quit. But uh, yeah, I want to be an artist and a rancher and that kind of stuff. And I had flying because I had little airplanes I could fly. And uh, to be quite honest, I got to where it was much more of a thrill walking in the studio than walking in the cockpit of a 727. So I thought, well, there's something wrong here. I need to go where I want to go and just I gritted my teeth, and I've been lucky, very lucky. But you've still had aviation in your life pretty much throughout with airplanes and helicopters. I and do. I have a helicopter that I learned to fly, which the poor instructor thought she could never teach me how to fly a helicopter. I was too old and too impatient. But I finally gritted through it and got a helicopter license. I have a Yak World War II Russian airplane that I I'd love to fly, and a little herbatic airplane and a home built. So I still have aviation in, in my life. And you've done some bush flying in Alaska as well, right? I have at Yukon, mostly in the Yukon, some in Alaska. 
But yeah, I went, I flew for a guy about seven years in a row with a Super Cub and an L-19, which was a World War, was a Vietnamese uh, foreign observer aircraft made by Cessna. They call it an L-19. Uh, mostly Super Cubs. And, yes. a, and a Wilga. There was an airplane called a Wilga, which was a really weird little airplane, but it flew well. It was a good bush plane. And these are all super airworthy looking airplanes. I've, I've seen most of these. You got to have some guts to climb in some of these. <laughs> you know, the dollar, dollar gets in the way sometimes of maybe making a little better decision. You know, it just does. You know, it's that way with a lot of businesses. So sure. I've flown Cubs with a lot of tape on them, you know, but they still flew. So you just had to be, you had to, you know, and they were all a little different. You just got used to them. Each one has own little, just like an animal, kind of really. I shouldn't say it like that, but they were they all had their own little little quirks. We just had to learn to learn to fly around those quirks. Sure, go ahead, Julie. As they say, any any uh, landing you walk away from is a good one, That's right? A good one. <laughs> That's right. With me, especially, yes. I have to add in here because he doesn't he doesn't tell people, but when we first started dating, the first gift he ever gave me was a parachute. And I should have known, but I should have known then. <laughs> God, I'm like, am I going to need this? <laughs> and he just laughed, no, you sit on it. And I thought, well, that doesn't do any good. <laughs> but anyway, that was the first gift he ever gave me. Well, and uh, the last time I saw you, we were talking about uh, flying in the helicopter with him. And uh, it's all fun and games until it's windy and he's getting near the power lines trying to get the cattle out from under the power lines. That's not fun. That's when Julie says, put this thing on the ground. Yes, and I do, and I did. Yeah. Now, how cool is this picture? Where is that, Julie? This is up in northern British Columbia. We were on a backpacking trip, and the, the lupin were just covered the hillsides. And so we just couldn't resist. I had to sit down in there, and he took a picture of me. But it was, it's beautiful up there. Don't you just hear the sound of music playing? There's little children running around. You just don't see them. The hills are alive with the sound of music and Edelweiss and all that. The Lupin were beautiful that year. Such a great picture. <laughs> That's me trying to pretend I'm a longhorn. These are, the, <laughs> these are some steers that, that were on the ranch here in Texas. And uh, T.D. had great longhorn, some great longhorn genetics there. They were very, very big. Now, you keep saying here in Texas. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> because, you know, all the great Texans came from Georgia. Okay, there you go. Okay. That's why you keep getting it mixed up. <laughs> I'm so confused. <laughs> yeah. We, we were just at an art show in Dallas, and so that's why I'm, I'm still in, I'm confused. It's okay. But yeah, that's the ranch in Texas. Which uh, is the one that you just sold, right? Correct. And this was originally part of the original four sixes. Correct. It was the original camp. It was, yes, it's called the eight camp, and it was the original headquarters of the four sixes. Uh, when Mr. Burnett settled that country, that's where they built the headquarters. And if you haven't already, you're going to start hearing a lot about the four sixes. How many of y'all been watching Yellowstone? There's going to be a spin-off about the Jimmy character going to the Four Sixes. It's going to be its own series that Taylor Sheridan, who's the one who did 1883 and was a producer on Yellowstone, is going to have this new show, and he just bought the Four Sixes Ranch. Or it's supposed to close Friday, did you, did you say? The last Friday, I think it closed. It did close. This past Friday. It, well, as far as we I know. haven't heard it did not, so I, I'm going to assume they're really, really close. They were very close. They were arguing over that lawyers involved, so... No. They, were, they just had some difficulties between the lawyers, I think. So it should have closed. S say it's not so. <laughs> Pardon? That there were lawyers involved. The what? There were lawyers involved? Well, it, well of course, it's a big deal. <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, you know, each one of them had to have a lawyer. Probably several. I'm, not, I'm missing all this. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. He's teasing you. Yeah. That's okay. Okay. Next picture. This is, was, again, up in, in northern British Columbia. And the place we went into, our, 
our guy took us in on a plane, landed on a glacier up between two peaks, landed on this glacier, and then we walked off the glacier and built this little camp on the side of this mountain and had piled up the rocks and made a little cook shack there. And the ptarmigan, the eagles would be chasing the ptarmigan around, and they'd come and hide in the tent with us. And, and so it was great fun. What is a ptarmigan? A little bird, a partridge-type bird up in the north, like a grouse. So those, grouse. those rocks weren't like that before you got there? No, we built that. And how wide an area did you have to cover to find all those? Oh, they was all rock slide, so we carried rocks. And was T.D. flying the plane? No, he wasn't, but I bet he wanted to. Is he a good Derek passenger? Was. Derek, yeah, Derek was flying. Is he a good passenger? I tell you what, if you have a pilot that you're a little worried about, he's a great man to have in the right seat. That's true, I bet. You got a backup. And do you have to have permission to land on a glacier? No. Well, I don't think so. No, as long as it's not in the national park. As long as it's not in the national park, you can just right. go land on a glacier anywhere. Yeah, a glacier is just like landing on a, in a, in a, a meadow. Unless it's in the national park, then you can't touch it, of course. We couldn't touch the meadow either, unless you had an emergency. But there's no law against landing on the glacier. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. I love this picture. Tell that's, me what's going on here, TD. <laughs> that's some of my, my Maasai friends in Africa. They're great guys. They're just, they, have, they have so much fun. They just, they love games. They absolutely just love to play games. And all you got to do is like get a, a, a plastic water, empty water bottle, put $5 in it, and run out there about 50 feet and set it on the ground in the contest they're on. And they laugh and howl and just, and they throw spears at it. And whoever gets, hits the bottle, he'll get some money in it, the $5. But, they just love it. They just they laugh all the time. They love games. And they've become dear friends over the years. Really good friends. And these are guys you met on your two year trip when you were living over there? Or is this a No, this trip? is after this is with actually this is a trip Julie was on. Julie was there as well on this trip. And then at one point did you own a, a hunting camp in Africa at one point? Did not own a hunting camp. I worked for them there and I belonged to APHA, but I did I did not own a hunting camp. So I you worked for one? Yep. Yep. And did I hear it got stampeded by elephants or something silly like that? No, well, we always had uh, little trouble with some elephants sometimes, but I don't remember any of our camps getting run over. What you might be thinking of, I might have told you a little bit of the story, it was in, uh, when I was in the Congo building a camp. Uh, I had a couple things there. A gorilla, a male gorilla, stayed right there in camp with us for three weeks as we were building this camp. He's all by himself, no females, but he was an adult. I don't know, he's just lonesome or whatever, he was there for, and I could get about from here to that podium, and that was it. If I took one step closer, he'd glare at me, and i just back off, and he'd just go back to washing his roots and eating. Um, we also had some elephants, some forest elephants, cows and calves come to that water tank and drink and then leave, but we, they started coming off enough and got used to us. They kind of hang around, you know, half a day or something in the shade. And we got to talking to them a lot. And uh, What did they say? <laughs> not much, really. But we just called them, like one we named Fraulein. And then I just loved this place in the Congo and the forest so much. I, I took Julia there the following year, was it? And we actually were, were going down and logging just a little logging road that they cut through the trees. They were logging some of that country. And uh, four cellars come out of the bush right up against them and run right into the Land Rover. And they're right real close and got out from here to there and were kicking dirt at us. And then they turn around and go back into the forest. And we yelled out the name Fraulein and this cow elephant turned around. And I, I, it was, I just, I could not believe it. She recognized either the sound of our voice, or what we said, you know, or maybe she recognized the frontline, the actual word. I have no idea, but she turned, turned right around, 
and came back about four steps. He had a little tiny baby, and she held him and let him you know, go any further. And a couple of young ones would come out and throw, you know, kick dirt at us and stuff. But every time she'd stop, she'd start to turn around and go back, and we'd say, throw a line, and she'd stop and turn around and look at us. I, mean, I swear this is what happened. Julie was there. It was a pretty amazing, really amazing. It sounds it. And the camp was still there? It is now. I haven't been back for a year. We supposed to, we've had a trip planned there for two years now, and uh, uh, I hope it's still there. But they've had a lot of trouble in the Congo, and uh, we haven't been able to get our visas. They keep, we, in fact, we were on the airplane leaving, what, a year and a half ago, two years ago, and they pulled us off the airplane. They called and canceled our visa just at that moment. They're having some trouble over there. Well, and I wouldn't think there's any small trouble involving elephants. <laughs> well, these are great elephants. They were really, really, it was really cool to find this. And I'll hand the bank to Julie for this one. Those are a bunch of little Maasai girls in a village. I had been to Africa a couple times before TD and I started going together. And we go back to the same village. There's not too many villages where the people are still very traditional. And we kept going back there. So over the course of years, I got to see these little girls grow up. And so when we'd go back, I would take pencils and things so that when they do their schooling, they could have some pencils. So I was, I was at the village, and I was handing out pencils here and pencil sharpeners to the little girls. They're beautiful. They are. And talk about the sketching you do when you're on trips. Um, when I go on trips, I like to take, I always take a journal and a little watercolor kit that I can take and pencils. And so I like to sit and draw and do little watercolor sketches if I can really quick. Um, some of these are from a camp. The upper ones are from a camp I was in and they had a couple orphan, they had an orphan um, Impala baby and an orphan Kudu baby. And so I just kind of hung around camp and sketched them and got to paint them. And, and then I make notes, you know, there was tufts of hair coming out their ears or whatever type notes that I noticed with the animals. And then this is one of the tools that I use when I go back home um, to do paintings. Then I can go back and read through my notes. And so I have, I have tons of journals from all my trips with little drawings and sketches and notes and, and things that help with my research. You ever let TD look at those? Yeah, he d he does it also. You do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Did you do that before y'all were together? Yeah, I did before, but uh, uh, to me these are finished. I can't finish like that. I'm a, my stuff's a little looser, a little rougher, but loose. Damn it. Yeah. A loose family, right? Yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, I think her stuff is fantastic. I love her little sketches, little study sketches. And do you ever work from her sketches? No, those are hers. I got you. Tell us about this piece. This looks like a lot of fun too. This is a sculpture of. Uh, I ran wild horses for forever. I got to talk on and on about the wild horses, but this is a sculpture of. Uh, whether the guys roped this horse or got it in a trap and, and roped it, it's, they're coming out with a wild horse. And what you can do, the guy in front, you just kind of keep messing. They kind of keep messing around and walling the horse around the wild horse, which is in the middle, and he'll hook onto the guy in the front, and he'll just take off pretty quick. He'll he'll really last on. He'll stay right on that horse's hindquarters, and you can go out 15 miles to the truck or wherever. So that's what these guys are doing. The guy in the front has got that horse hooked onto him a little bit, and he's just he's headed headed to the corrals or wherever they they're going to go to to load it. I chased horses with a guy for. It's going to make this. Up, I'll try to make this short. 1971, the Wild Horse Hunting Act was enacted, which meant no one could touch a wild horse except the government. You could not even get your own saddle horse if you got away with the wild bucks. You could do that. You had to turn over and let a government agent do that. We went to the government before that act went into effect in 1971 and said, look, 
Minford Beard, my friend, controlled about 600,000 acres they'd want to cattle on. Some, not many, but a few cattle. He said, we're going to buy all the you Your count will pay for the horses you count. And then we'll agree with your cow. You have so much ahead. Then after that, the horses are ours, period. You have no say over them. They're ours. And we'll pay you an AUM unit rate per, you know, an AUM for whatever's left. But after six months, we get six months to try to clean them up. There were, there were, the rancher did not want to get rid of them. They liked them. But uh, she kind of thought they were. And before she passed away, Annie said that she had made a horrible mistake because you don't know, like the wild horses today are, they're in pretty bad condition. You know, they're, they're all in corrals and, and stockyards and stuff. It's not a pretty sight. And it's a very expensive thing for the government as well. The ranchers, they won't get rid of them. They want to keep some. And after we, after we did that, and they said, okay, we'll do that. We had a waiting list in the, within two years of every horse we could catch, they wanted to buy it. Some rancher wanted to buy them because they were good horses. We, we, we culled the herders down. We tried to change the studs every three or four years in different bunches. So they grew up big and strong. There weren't so many of them. They weren't inbred. And they were really, really good, loyal, sure-footed horses for ranches in that country. Um, and this is just a sculpture of a guy taking on a wild horse. And the title? I can't remember. <laughs> I'm sorry. Line Dance. Line Dance, yeah, Line Dance, yeah, Line Dance. <laughs> Don't even know my own sculpture. Oh, and this is a, this is a sculpture of, of a very, very famous bucking horse. It was... At the national finals, they, they crown a horse, bucking horse of the year every year. And it's voted on by stock contractors, but the votes of the cowboys, the PRCA riders that ride in that event, counts more. This horse was seven times the world's champion bucking horse. The name was Commotion. And Mr. Butler, who owned the horse, wanted me to do a monument of this horse. He was very famous. And I talked to a lot of guys that rode him. I went out to the ranch and he used him to, to breed mares with to raise more horses. So I spent a lot of time with this horse and then talked to a lot of guys that rode him, watched lots of videos and stuff. And I did the one in a, about, a, I don't know, one and a half to twice life sculpture of him. And it's in Elk City, Oklahoma. Very cool. Hmm. This is a pastel of some Andalusian mares. We were on a trip in Spain and through friends, we were able to stay on a, a beautiful ranch, and they raised Spanish fighting bulls and these Andalusian mares. And the mares were all either pregnant or had already had their colts, and they were in these lush fields with the rock walls. It was beautiful, and, and the purple flowers were growing everywhere. And so I saw these, these mares with all the wonderful green and purples reflecting off their white coats, and um, so I, I titled it, I just had to do it, and I titled it Ladies of Spain. So beautiful. We've already talked about this one, so I'm going to skip past it and let you keep the mic. Yeah, and we're back to the wild horses now. <clears throat> the horse on the right has been the best horse I've ever owned in my life. He was a, a son of a, of a horse off the King Ranch called Mr. San Pepe. And I cut on him, I tripped stairs on him, and he loved to run wild horses. And this particular paint horse here, I had chased for two years. We'd go over January, February when it was cold, but if the colts got cut away from the mares, they were old enough to get along by themselves. So we waited till January, February, and then it was cold. Sometimes you get a, if you could get sneak up on them, and bust it into them as fast as you could, they'd go about a quarter of a mile and they had to get their air again. But if you ever let them get that second air, you were finished for the day, you were done. Anyway, this particular horse, I remember chasing her and it's a her, I thought it was a stallion. I thought it was, a, you know, there were three studs traveling together. There were the three mares traveling together. And then I finally caught this mare. She was, she was a, I, I kind of felt a little bad after I captured her because 
she had been so wild and so clever and getting away and so smart, so so tough, but she went to a good home. She looks a little sad. Well, she'd just been run for 15 miles in that deep snow. I'd be sad too, really. And uh, that horse, I was just like I said, I can't say good enough about him. He was awesome. I love that horse. That looks like such a great painting, too. I am, wouldn't, yeah. Hint, if you hint, were, wait, yeah. Nudge, nudge, nudge. Would be a fun painting, wouldn't it? And, uh, yeah. TD, do I understand that you're learning a little painting from Julie? She's trying to teach me. It's like trying to teach your wife how to fly an airplane. You just don't go there. <laughs> you know, really don't. But she's very patient. She's trying, trying hard, yeah. Well, they say if a husband and wife can do wallpaper together, then that's the true test, right? Is that similar, We're not going to try the wallpaper. The paint? We'll do the painting first, okay? All right. This is, we were at a, a ranch over there in Texas, and <laughs> at um, the Morehouse Ranch. With which some people neighbors, from Georgia originally. Which some people from, originally from Georgia, and um, they were, Dee was helping, I was running around with, with my camera and my sketchbook, and they brought the cattle in, and they were going to take them to weigh them and ship them, and they got down to the water, and they try not to let them get to the water and drink before, because they're taking them to weigh them to ship them and sell them. And if they drink water, that's a little bit of cheating because they add a lot of weight that way. So they were trying to, the cowboys were trying to keep them out of the water, but they came running down the hill into the water there. And so the title, Drinks for All My Friends, but the, it was it was really challenging. And I loved doing this piece because it was, there were so many cattle. There's probably only, I cut out a lot of cattle because it was really hard telling which tail belonged to which head and ears and everything, trying to keep it all separated out. So I deleted a lot of cows. Um, but it was it was really fun to do this one and, and try to sort out the colors and parts and pieces and what belonged to who. So And, and I had fun with the title, so it was just one I had to... I know the uh, article that ran on the show in Western Art Collector magazine, I've had several people email me or call me about this particular one, how much they love that title. It was fun. I just, I don't know, I was doing it, and it just, the title just jumped into my head, and I thought, i got to do that title. And we talked about this one earlier, so I'm going to skip it. <laughs> there. You want to Sorry. Sorry. This is also uh, at the ranch in Texas, and uh, Dee Dee had some buffalo, some American bison, on the ranch and the beautiful sunsets and and skyscapes and stuff that I love doing and this is a pastel and the, it was this gorgeous sky that night and the buffalo were out there and the sun was going down and there's just if you on the painting if you look there's some nice highlights on the buffalo just as that sun was going down and so it was it was the blessing of the beasts well and I thought it would be fun if we uh, took one of TDs and maybe put it with one of Julie's, and ignore the fact that there are no salmon in Texas. <laughs> Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> My bad Photoshop skills notwithstanding, I thought that was just a little fun. But it's a nice composition. You got the bear in the clouds. All. Yeah. A lot of I action. Thought, I thought it was okay. TD, this was a really cool one, I think. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, this is a study of my cat, or a study, I call them studies, for a monument that I did for St. Louis Zoo. And uh, the female's about, I'm gonna say she's twice life, and she's taking her cubs to hide them in another, in another den. Uh, the little guy in the back, when he gets tired, she'll put that one down and pick him up, take him a ways and just, you know, leapfrog him back and forth till she finally gets them hidden. And they usually do this two or three times before the cubs are old enough that they can travel by themselves and go to a new den. They gotta pick them up and carry them and go back and forth. So this is what she's doing. And this is just a study for the monument. Did you say till they can go to the museum? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sir. Is that sir? what he said? Till they can move on their own. Oh, okay. <laughs> to the museum, I see. TD, when you're doing something for a zoo, do you feel like you have to be a little bit more anatomically correct and, 
and and so on than you normally would or you, they come to you they obviously want what you do you know i don't really no no i don't because if they're going to hire me to do a job they already know how i'm going to do it you know right. what my work is like so they're going to hire me to do a job they're not going to hire me to do something and say then tell me how to do it i would do it anyway you know i'm very very fortunate that i I get to do what I want to do. I don't have to do something. You know, I hope that doesn't ever happen because it would be difficult. But uh, they know what I work like. You, you know, I, I still try to be anatomic correct. You're supposed to be. Right, right. But the looseness, it's, it's hard to be loose in monumental pieces because of the you know, thumb mark or fingers smashing this clay around in a maquette or a study is one thing, but when you get it, Four times bigger, your hands are not that. Big. Your hands are not that big. You need palms that are, you know, 15 inches wide. So it's hard to stay loose without having different palm marks. But you try. So you you just need to size up your hands and have like some some. Mitts you need to. Or something. They have big fat hands. Yeah. Yeah. Or make some mitts that are the right size or something. Yeah. Maybe we can start a business doing that. Well, what, uh, what's happened on a couple of monuments is they've used chicken wire and then put stuff on the chicken wire. But that chicken wire, when you cut it, all those little galvanized pieces stick up, and they're always stabbing your hands and your fingers. So your fingers do get swelled up in your hands, so they get bigger. Well, and speaking of that, uh, we were talking last night about a lot of the great sculptors in your generation. Many of them have gone to painting because of the physical torture and beating that your body takes, whether it's doing these small pieces with your hands and your elbows and so on, or when you're up on that scaffolding, the wear and tear on your back and your knees, it's a rough job, right? Well, uh, yeah. You gotta be, yeah, you get worn out carrying 50 pound buckets of clay up a ladder, up a scaffolding, you know, or falling off the scaffolding, which I've done a time or two. I'm telling stories on you. He has fallen off the scaffolding a number of times onto the concrete floor. And so he fell one time, and I look over there. You kind of hear a big splat. And, and he's laying on the concrete with the big bucket of clay. I saved the clay. I saved the clay. That's all I can think of. Yeah, what about your melon? <laughs> More worried about the clay, I'm guessing. <laughs> I didn't want to carry it back up there. So do you, do you see that in your future at some point, kind of winding down sculpture in favor of painting? Yeah, the, the big sculptures I do, probably. I would love to do a couple of big ones, like the elk that we talked about earlier. I'd love to do that one. The September tempers? Yes. But I wouldn't, that wouldn't take a scaffolding. You know, a step ladder would be plenty high. Or just a board on some on some railroad ties running around, it'd be plenty high enough. Yeah, OSHA sounds like they would sign off on that. <laughs> sounds OSHA real doesn't safe, come doesn't out it? to the ranch. Sounds real safe. They've never been out there, <laughs> no. Sounds real safe. So, uh, Julie, tell me about this painting. When I first looked at it, I thought it was upside down. That's what everybody thinks. I, and that, that's part of the reason why I did it, is because I thought it's upside down. It's just the reflection of the in the water, the grouse, this is in Africa, the grouse were coming down to get water. And I looked at it and I kept thinking, it's upside down. And I thought, I need to paint that and see what the reaction is, because it's just different. And that is the reaction that a lot of times people look at it from across the room and they go, they hung that painting upside down. And then it's like, once they walk up and then see the grouse in it, then they can see it's not. But it was, it's kind of fun to do something different like that once in a while and just play with people's minds. And so if you put that one and that one together, you get this one. <laughs> I don't think the grouse would be there. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. I always wonder if uh, those two kids both decide they're both tired at the same time, what happens? She, she'll hide one of them, push it in the grass, hide it, and obviously tell it to stay put, you know, like they're supposed to. And it would take the other a little bit and come back and just leapfrog them. They don't, you know, that's a rough life. They don't all make it. 
this one was so fun. The first time, I never really thought of traveling much. I liked being at home. The first trip I ever went to, some artists called me up and they said, we're putting together a group. We're going to go down to Mexico and paint. And we got a, we have an estate in, in Acapulco right on the ocean or the sea there, and we're going to hang out for a week and go out and paint. And we went out to this little village, and the, the ladies were doing their laundry on the rocks down in the river. And I just happened to turn around, because we were all looking down in the river at them, and I happened to turn around, and this lady was going down the street right behind us. And she was fabulous. She was strutting. Boy, she was strutting her stuff, and she had a big lip full of chew. She had her laundry done. And at the time, she this, this dress that she had on was skin tight, and it was the hottest pink you've ever seen. And they didn't have that color and watercolor at the time, but so I did the best I could. But she was just a strutting it down there, and it just, she killed me. I just turned around and saw it, and it was boom. And with that hot pink dress and that bright blue bucket, and it was, it was just made to be painted. And the title? This is a watercolor. Acapulco pink. I go for pretty in pink. Pretty Pretty big. I don't think that movie had been out yet. Either. Probably not. These are the same Maasai girls that were in the photograph with me that I was giving pencils to. Um, I'd been to this village a number of times, and the Maasai features are so great on the girls, and they wear these call the beaded collars when they're young and eligible. They're marrying age, which is young, and um, these girls were all just lined up. And I just, I loved their stern look, but they were all dressed up because they were trying to impress the boys. No, they don't do that, do they? Yeah. Uh, Julie was talking, these are unmarried Maasai ladies. And that's why the necklaces, the beaded necklaces are on their neck. But you, I'm sure a great many of you have seen television programs where they film these people and, they, and the, they'll be dancing. And these these beaded necklaces will will actually come up and float. They do that with their shoulders, and you never really realize it. I thought, how do they do that? And finally, I was behind them and watched real close, and they just bounce their shoulders a little bit. They catch they catch it just right for those things will float in the air and just spin. These are Caro girls in the um, Omo Valley in Ethiopia. And I was in camp one night, and they were, T.D. was out and about, and they were getting all dressed up to have a dance that night. So they were putting the face paint on each other, and the, the Karo are different from the Maasai in that they wear the goat hide skins, skirts, and that lots and lots of white beads and cowrie shells. And so they were getting all, they do a lot of the white chalk face paint, and they were getting ready to have a dance. This is a, a sculpture of a lesser kudu. Uh, they're throughout Central Africa. Some in, there's some in Tanzania as well. Uh, I had a very, very good guy who was a, a, a head tracker where I was at. It was the same village that Julie was at that painted the Cairo people. And he had three wives. He had a, his first wife, he had his children with, and he had a pair of twins. And or a set of twins. I'm sorry, boy and a girl. They, I knew when they were they weren't that big, and for years, and they were just great, great people. But they had one wife that was named Mersha, which is our word for the lesser kudu, which is a very e almost effeminate. The males are they're so delicate and so pretty, and so I named this couple Mersha. It's a, a lesser kudu. Let's hear it for our artist tonight. Absolutely. Thank you for that. We've got just a few minutes if anybody might have a question for either of our artists. Let's see if I can see anybody out here. Anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Yes, sir. I did get one picture of her, just one. 
and, and she was gone. And so I quickly jotted down notes, how hot pink the dress was, and it was shiny, and she was strutting her stuff, and, and the light coming through that blue bucket. So it was a combination. So I got the one photograph, and then, and then I just jotted down as many notes as I could right quickly, um, just so that when I went back and looked at it, I could remember those things. Yes, sir. <laughs> Did you become friends with the teacher that kicked you out of class like, like TD? No. Um, they, they were mostly professors on sabbatical. And, and so they were there, and they pretty much came to MSU there at Bozeman, Montana to fly fish and ski or whatever time of year it was. So they, they kind of would show up on Monday and say, get this project done by the end of the week, and they'd never show up again. So... We never really saw him much, but it was always tempting. There was one guy in particular that I thought, I wish I knew where he was, but it doesn't matter. And uh, Deborah Butterfield and John Buck, did they teach there? They would have been. I had John Buck for a couple classes, yes. Did you? Mm -hmm. Okay. We won't go into that then. <laughs> anybody else a question? Is there anybody I'm not seeing? Going once, going twice. Thanks for coming out, everybody. Thank you. Once again, for our artists.